like this. And now I do I do my best with the <laughs> screen sharing. So like this, and you share and. You should be able to see the correct version now. Am I correct? Yeah. yeah? Yes. The, the full screen, marvelous. Okay. So uh, let us start with the with the introduction to the book that we briefly um, spoke about uh, last week. Um, so as I said, as I mentioned previously, um, the book is extremely multi-layered. So as you will notice, Whenever Dupuy talks about a certain topic, he will also meander through several other topics. And very often he provides certain hints, suggestions, um, different suggestive bits and fragments. Um, there's a lot of them in, in the whole text, in every chapter, as you will see, and it is impossible to cover them all. So, you know, if I don't cover something, just bring it up in the discussion. I will just try to focus on the main thread of what he tries to do in this particular chapter. And uh, uh, hopefully I won't leave out any of the most important things. So see, he says at the very beginning that the superficial layer, the, 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 the highest layer of this particular uh, book will be the 10 Marcy conferences, which took place from 1946 to 1953, and which brought together an trans inter or transdisciplinary uh, team or group of very diverse and very interesting people who started a project that got the name of cybernetics. And cybernetics, Dupuy says, that is basically the forerunner of cognitive science. And the main aim of the book will be uh, threefold, more or less. So he will constantly try to show that cybernetics is, in fact, at the root of cognitive science, but it is something that is constantly um, skimmed over in the official histories of science. So uh, uh, this, the cybernetics is uh, to cognitive science as you know that drunken uncle that comes to the Christmas party and uh, everybody or, or, or that nobody wants to talk about uh, at the Christmas party even though he's absent and whatnot. So cybernetics is something like that part of the family but nobody really wants to kind of go into that. Um, and he is trying to bring this to the surface because he thinks there's something extremely important to be found there. Uh, but at the same time, even though cognitive science is rooted in uh, cybernetics, it, is, it has also undergone several modifications. So there are several different changes in, in certain fundamental conceptions have occurred, which are important. Uh, and Dupuy will go into them and try to explain why they occurred and uh, why is this important. So he will constantly try to draw uh, 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 the, the implications of both the cybernetic conceptual framework and the modifications that ha happened later on. And this he does already, as you will see in this particular introductory, introductory uh, section. So he starts the discussion by uh, presenting what he calls a cybernetic credo. And this cybernetic credo basically consists of two main tenets, two main postulates. The first postulate is that thinking is computation. And the second main postulate is that in order to be able to scientifically account for such notions, such phenomena, such as, uh, as meaning, finality, and intentionality, um, um, we need to uh, account for them or, or elucidate them within the conception of physical laws. So these are the two main postulates, that thinking is a concept computation and that uh, meaning, finality, and intentionality can be derived from physical laws. And this uh, provides for a physicalist or mechanical theory of mind. So cyberneticians were basically trying to show the way out of the age-old mind-body problem, whereby they try to reduce the world of meaning, the domain of meaning, to the world or domain of physical laws. And as we will see in, in uh, the next chapter, um, the reason why their approach was different from other similar approaches in the past was because uh, because of the huge emphasis on models. So 
uh, as we will see um, in the background of the cybernetician uh, program is a very specific conception of knowing, uh, according to which to know means to be able to construct or reconstruct, that is to say, to be able to build a model uh, of the phenomenon you're interested in. So um, uh, we will go into that uh, next time in two weeks. Uh, but this is something that will be an important topic as well. So even though there have been mechanical theories of mind already, uh, the, cyber, cyber, uh, um, the, the, the theory of mind provided by the cyberneticians differs because of this emphasis on the modeling. Now, for everybody who is familiar with cognitive science, um, for anybody familiar with the cognitive science, the question will immediately pop up while why isn't this basically cognitivism? Um, in what way is this, these two postulates, um, anything special? And um, we will say, well, it is and it isn't. And it is precisely these differences that he's interested in that, and he will try to focus on. As I said before, um, cybernetics is at the origin of cognitive science, but at the same time, there have been certain changes uh, that have occurred later on, and he's interested in those. So um, let us then take a look at some of these differences. So what is cognitivism? Cognitivism is usually presented as a first paradigm within cognitive science. It is also sometimes called computationalism. Um, and it is it should be relatively well known to everybody who's present um, at this reading group. According to Dupuis, cognitivism came to be, so it emerged out, out of a peculiar alliance, which he will problematize throughout the whole book. And this is the alliance between science, cognitive science on the one hand, and philosophy of mind on the other hand. So the scientific part in cognitivism is supposed to take care of the naturalization of the mind. So it is uh, supposed to provide for a uh, naturalistic, that is to say, causal account of the mind. Philosophy of mind, traditional analytical philosophy of mind, on the other hand, was rooted in the idea of folk psychology and was basically uh, trying to provide uh, an account of how mentality works um, by using or by re referring to notions that are to be that are found in folk psychology notions such as for example intentionality and reasons so basically cognitivism was an attempt to bring together these two domains that seem to have parted ways uh, at the beginning of uh, so uh, at the beginning of the um, modern science so from 16th to, to 18th century namely the domain of causes on the one hand and reasons on the other hand that's a nice endeavor and a worthwhile aim, goal, but how could one achieve this? Well, famously or infamously, uh, depending on your own uh, proclivities and preferences, uh, cognitivism tried to achieve this by introducing the intermediate level. So the level of what is sometimes called mental causes or mental causality, and this level is basically the level of symbolic co uh, computation. Uh, as Depuy puts it, it is on the strength of symbols that cognitivism claims to be able to span the gap that separates the physical world from the world of meaning. Computation may therefore be described as a central peer of the cognitivist bridge. So symbols, why were these symbols so interesting? Because it seems that they span three different levels. So symbols are usually represented as items that have some sort of a physical form. That is to say, they are embedded into the domain of causes. But at the same time, they are also stand for something in the world. They are representations of something in the world, and therefore they have a certain meaning. So they are embedded into the domain of semantics, and they can be manipulated formally. That is to say, by following certain algorithmic, uh, rigid, formal rules. So this domain of syntax seemed to be an intermediary level, which somehow by um, um, introducing this uh, the domain of symbols could connect what uh, might seem as two separate domains, that is to say, uh, domain of causes and meanings. 
Dupuy then presents uh, some of the main key differences between cognitivism and cybernetics. So we've seen what co uh, cognitivism is, and then he tries to show how cybernetics differs, differs from cognitivism. So the first difference between cognitivism and cybernetics is, is how they construe physics. He says that cognitivism has a certain very naive understanding of physics. He calls it the fictional or philosopher's physics. What does he mean by that? He basically means that for the most part in cognitivist models, what you will find is an elaborate Newtonian mechanics. So a slightly more fancy version of the mechanics develops in, developed in the 17th and 18th century. And this usually also uses uh, the, the, the standard notions such as notion of linear causality. Uh, on the other hand, cyberneticians, they used what he calls true or physicist physics. That is to say, they were more in touch with what was actually going on in the physics, and they were kind of taking seriously in the developments that were then still being avant-garde. This was in the 40s and 50s, and the chaos theory was just developing, and they were already dabbling in what later came to be known as complex dynamic systems, uh, and with certain ideas that came out of that, for example, the notion or the idea of circular causality. Then the notion of com computation, according to uh, Dupuy, the way this notion is used in cognitivism and cybernetics differs, because we've seen that in cognitivism, computation is something that is symbolic. That is to say, it is conceptual. It, it pertains to the level of mental causality, and this is basically abstract causality. There is no such thing to be found in, cybernetic, uh, in, in cybernetics models. They are way more hardcore, way more orthodox. For them, computation is always pure. It's always blind. That is to say, it is physicalist, and it relies strictly on concrete causality. That is to say, on physicalist causality. There are no intermediate uh, levels. Also, when it comes to meaning, the two approaches differ. Cognitivism, drawing on the folk psychological terms, understands meaning in a more human-related sense. So they will talk about intentionality and so on and so forth. And there is space and there is room for reasons in this conception of mentality. For the cyberneticians, meaning is more universal and abstract, as Dupuy puts it, and is... Um, more structuralist as he will as as he terms it i will get back to this towards the end of the presentation so it is no longer something that is in any meaningful way pun intended related to human beings to human persons okay so we've seen that there is like a shift of understanding of some of the key tenets that can be found in cybernetics and then Dupuy draws out certain implications that will be important later on as well. And he uses them partly to illustrate what he will be doing throughout the book and also already to kind of prepare the ground for what will happen later on. So first implication, there is a famous idea that the computer metaphor that has become popular in cognitive science is basically of cybernetics origin. According to Dupuy, this is false. And it is false on two counts. First count, uh, it is false historically because computers became developed later. There was no computer. Uh, uh, there was no ob uh, uh, cybernetics made no ref reference to a computer, an object that had yet to be invented in the form in which we know it, as Dupuy puts it. But it's also fallacious philosophically because not only is not is um, computer not the leading. Uh, foundation for the mechanized conception of the mind, but precisely the opposite is, is true. And here we come to the central maxim, the one that I already presented last time, that will be the main point that Dupuy will try to make throughout this book. Um, and it can be sum, summed up as follows. The cybernetician's first thesis, so that cognition is basically uh, computation, amounted to analyzing and describing what is to think, not to deciding whether it is possible to conceive of machines that think. It is important to see, says Dupuy, that cybernetics represented not the anthropomorphization of the mach machine, but rather the mechanization of the human. That is to say, by reconceptualizing what it means to think, what it means to cognize, cybernetics, cyberneticians paved the way for the development of 
digital computer and the idea that maybe we can build artificial intelligence. It was not the computer that started the process. So it was this particular change in the realm of idea that eventually uh, uh, resulted in this particular synthesis between the idea of digital computer and uh, cognitive science. The second implication that is important, cyberneticians had a very, very strong, very rigid, very pure conception of computation, whereby conception was understood as being completely and purely mechanical, uh, completely blind. There's no room for meaning and symbols. Uh, what they were talking about was basically networks of idealized neurons. Meanings for them was not related to abstract causality, so there's no mental causality for cyberneticians, but there is only physical causality. So what they were trying to develop is physics of meaning. And at the very beginning of their project, they actually referred to what they were doing as developing teolo teleological mechanisms, which on the surface level might sound like a, a paradoxical term, uh, because you have te teleology and me mechanisms put together, but that was precisely what they were trying to do. They were trying to show that phenomena or concepts such as teleology basically could be reduced or brought down to mechanisms. But what needs to, to happen in order for this to occur is to have a broader conception uh, uh, of mechanism. Uh, and this is wh wh where the uh, relation to the more uh, refined conception of what physics is comes into play and where the notion that will be central later on of circular causality enters the picture as well. Now, the reason why the we think this is important is because we, we see something very similar happening in connectionism, which we might say is almost nowadays becoming the prevalent paradigm in cognitive science and even in uh, different types of tech learning, machine learning in general. And very often, Dupuis says it is presented as if concept connectionism was some something new, so as if it represented a move away from the cognitivism towards something novel. But Dupuis says, no, actually, it's a step back. It's a step back towards the cybernet cybernet cybernetics roots, uh, uh, which were somehow uh, changed, altered in cognitivism. And the reason why this is so important is also because certain critiques against launched against cognitivism no longer stand against cybernetics, and they also don't stand, they're not useful when, when you use them for connectionism. This is the famous critique uh, put forward by Searle between simulation and duplication. So Searle famously said that, you know, if you just simulate the, the digestive processes, uh, you, you haven't really uh, captured, you haven't really um, enacted or um, instantiated uh, metabolism. So, you know, if you simulate uh, the digestion of pizza, you're not actually digesting pizza. But Dupuis says this is all well and fine for uh, cognitivism, but for cybernet cybernetics, this simply doesn't um, apply. Why? Because for cybernetics, duplication is simulation. So according to cybernetics, any reference to meaning is basically a reference to something that does not have a certain um, 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 specific substance that would be outside of the realm of simulation. So he gives the example of money and he provides like a very specific understanding of how money can be understood and that the, the value of money basically is related to how it operates within a certain framework. So if you have a counterfeit money, as long as it is part of that net, uh, network, it has value just as some other money that is printed by, by the central bank uh, has value. Uh, because it is integrated into this particular framework. So the the as long as the simulation work, that's basically all there is to it. And if you have a duplication such as this counterfeit money, it's equally good as long as it can you know operate in this particular manner. For the for the cybernetician says uh, Dupuis, meaning is by its very nature counterfeit. Its essence is confused with its appearance. 
To stimulate the, its essence, for example, by means of a model is to remain true to it since simulation amounts actually to duplicating it. So basically, if you create a model, you've basically dupli duplicating uh, something that by its nature is simulation. So meaning, for example, is always simulation by its definition. So if you du duplicate a certain system that is capable of capturing this, there is no nothing is left over that that remains unexplained. Now, cyberneticians differed in how they understood this particular process. So some took the stance that uh, when you duplicate something or where you have this model account of a certain phenomenon, you're basically demystifying appearance. That is to say, you're showing uh, the true nature of a certain phenomenon. But there were also some who said that these phenomena are inevitable because they are useful heuristics. Uh, so phenomena are understood or need to be understood as though they were teleological, as though they had meaning. And this is in reference to Kantian tradition where you have this distinction between um, epistemological difference between the mechanical domain and the uh, domain of phenomena, but also something that can be ontologically reduced. So ontologically, there are only mechanisms, but still you have to introduce uh, on the epistem epistemological level a certain concepts that um, that play a certain explanatory role with certain phenomena. So intentionality, for example, would be something like that. And uh, uh, we will get to this later on. And the final implication is he says the following, cognitivism is an heir to cybernetics, but it is also an attempt to alleviate the physicalist or eliminativist excesses of cybernetics. However, the way it went about doing this, even though according to Dupuis, it was a valid or a noble project, was not particularly skillful. He says that this strange synthesis between cog early cognitive science and analytic philosophy was an unhappy accident. So as you will see, he's not a big fan of analytical philosophy of mind. And he says that there were way more um, elaborate and intricate philosophical alternatives available back then. He explicitly refers to Husserlian and even post-Husserlian phenomenology, which could have been a way better interlocutor to, to science than the, the classical analytical philosophy of mind. Okay, finally, there is this question of humanism or anti-humanism. So he is trying to show that all these debates, they are not just something that is interesting from, say, a certain uh, epistemic point of view, but they have broader, that is to say, existential and ethical implications. There is an ongoing back and forth between epistemology and uh, philosophy of science and the realm of ethics, the realm of existence, or so the, the, the broadest realm of existence. And there is a famous critique that cybernetics means the death of human person or death of human personality. And Dupuis refers to Nagel and um, uh, his idea that uh, in, in the contemporary scientific worldview, person or personality is a dying notion so that we are witnessing a death of human being. And um, Dupuis goes into a bit of a discussion about this and he will, as you will see, return to this in later chapters as well. Namely, he brings into the debate the famous Heidegger saying, that cybernetics is a pinnacle of humanism. So it's not a death of human personality. What Heidegger does is he spins this around. He does a 180 on this. And he says that basically cybernetic is a pinnacle of humanism. It is the height of metaphysics. Now, what does Heidegger mean by this? Because we will cr critique this approach. Metaphysics, according to Heidegger, basically refers to uh, the notion that there has to be some sort of a primary primal primordial being and through the history this the role of this human uh, the, of this primal being uh, was changed 
it was in the past it was something that was relegated to the domain of deity so to, 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 to god and then slowly it became anthropomorphized so the human being became this primordial being and according to this notion or this conception everything is subdued to human purposes so everything is subdued to what Heidegger calls the calculating thought. So how something can be understood in relation to me as a human being, how it can be used for my purposes. And cybernetics as technoscience, or technoscience as he calls it, is basically the culmination of this process. So what is needed now, what would be the remedy to, to, to rectify this particular state of affair is what Heidegger famously refers to as deconstruction. We have to deconstruct certain metaphysical notions and their historical. Um, so, so, so we, we need to kind of uh, be um, able to understand their historical genesis and then eventually break through them into a different way of doing philosophy, of different way of thinking, and in different way into different way of being. So we have to move from what Heidegger calls calculating thought to contemplative thought. And when he talks, when he's attacking um, humanism, he is not defending any form of barbar barbarism, although, you know, given the given what happened in the 30s and 40s, one could maybe um, add some comments to that. Uh, he says he's not defending any barbarism, but that that, that it's only the um, techno scientific thought that can, that sees the the critique of humanism uh, as leading necessarily into into uh, some sort of barbaric anti humanism. And this is not the case. He thinks that it could be transcended. It could be moved into something else entirely. However, then Dupuy does one of his twists and he says, well, it's interesting what happened to this particular Heideggerian notion when it came to the French soil. So what the French structuralists did with it. So they basically were fascinated by some of the things that Heidegger was doing. But at the same time, they would claim that cybernetics was actually the pinnacle of anti-humanism and the height of deconstruction at the same time. So they managed to combine the construction which was taken from Heidegger and cybernetics, which Heidegger was critiquing and put them together into a new uh, um, uh, constellation. So why and how? Well, uh, they basically, in a certain sense, they, they simply shifted the value, uh, um, the assessment of certain proclamations. So for example, the idea subject is merely a machine or as, uh, Sartre famously put it, the inhuman is merely the mechanical. Basically what uh, the structuralists did, did was they, they said, yes, that's true and that's okay. <laughs> so there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's true, subject is but a machine. The inhuman, which is the, the subject, is merely the mechanical. So what happened here was basically the death of subject, the deconstruction leads to the death of subject and leads to the subject subjectless cognition, which is precisely what cybernetics, uh, cyberneticians were trying to do. So instead of the famous Descartes uh, cogito, um, what we get is not the, uh, um, the Kantian I think, but it thinks, so the impersonal it thinks. So if you follow the, the, the uh, Heidegger's call to deconstruction through, you end up basically in a position that is actually very close to what cyberneticians were doing. So which is it? The Heideggerian, the, the Heideggerian uh, interpretation or the structuralist interpretation? Is the cybernetics a pinnacle of humanism or the pinnacle of anti-humanism? Dupuis says, well, actually, it's both or it's neither. Why? <laughs> so here Dupuis develops an idea that I already um, mentioned or tried to briefly uh, explain last time, namely a certain strange dialectics that is at work when we talk about these things. So he says, says that cybernetics is both the root of cognitive science, but also a turning point in the history of human conceptions of humanity. Why so? Well, from what I can understand, it is 
it seems that cybernetics is basically the pinnacle of a certain split, which Whitehead, Alfred North Whitehead, refers to as a bifurcation of nature. So this split between the subjective and objective, between the phenomenal mind and be between the phenomenal nature and uh, between the, the, the physical nature. So this dual conception of reality here somehow attains its height. Why so? Because there is a certain schizophrenia which comes to the fore with cybernetics. When I say schizophrenia, I mean this literally as a two-mindedness. There is the splitting of the mind, okay? So there is a mechanizing mind, the mind that is pursuing this um, project of mechanization, where it tries to turn everything into a pure machine. And there is the mechanized mind, which is precisely the mind as turned into machine. And the mechanizing mind represents the height of humanism. Why? Because it represents the highest form that can be taken by a subject that is capable of asserting its ultimate volition and power onto everything, to the point where it is basically able to negate itself and turn itself into a thing. So precisely the opposite of what it is. And the mechanized mind, on the other hand, is the pit of represents the pit of deconstruction, because here the mind becomes precisely the opposite of itself. So what we get is actually a huge split. The mechanizing mind becomes, by, by asserting its capacity to say no to everything and to even say no to itself, to its own nature and turn it into something else, becomes the pure subject, the pure transcendental outwardly something, it basically becomes what Sartre refers to as nothingness, and the mechanized mind becomes simply a pure thing, another thing in the world. So what you get is like a complete split that is the, 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 at the core of this uh, modernist project where you have a transcendental subject that is separated from the world and you cannot get it together. Um, and in the way that Dupuy presents it is actually very interesting. So, so he says that it's funny how when you talk about naturalizing the mind, this in, in this particular context, in the context of cybernetics and in the context of cognitive science, what you end up is artificial intelligence. So how these two notions, the project of naturalizing the mind and the project of artificial intelligence are actually closely interrelated. And he provides approximately the, the, the following picture. So when you want to natural or naturalize the mind, naturalization from the perspective of the, uh, of the worldview that was developed in the 16th and uh, from 16th to 18th century basically means mechanization. Nature is construed as the domain of uh, mechanical processes. And these mechanical processes are as the very name itself conveys, are uh, modeled on the, the ground of a machine. So, so they are basically, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the nature is construed as a huge machine that operates as a huge machine. So basically the process of naturalization is a process of artific artificialization. So the process of mechanization and therefore artificialization. It is precisely a move away from nature. So to try to naturalize the mind by mechanize it is precisely to take it outside of the mind. And that is why you end up with artificial intelligence. So you start by trying to embed something in nature, but because this nature is artificialized, you are basically, and you, you end up with a mechanical conception of the mind, which is precisely everything, anything but nature broadly construed. And one of the points that uh, Dupuy is here making is the more you try to naturalize the mind by pursuing this particular path, the more it is becoming, on the one hand, the mind that you're trying to, that is naturalized, is becoming more and more machine-like, whereas you yourself who are trying to naturalize the mind are becoming more and more um, 
outerworldly or uh, uh, separated from the world because you are precisely the, the subject that is kind of doing these things. So there is like an exile from nature uh, in two separate directions. So what is Dupuis' position? He doesn't really spell it out here. He's clearly not trying to defend the old humanism, but neither is he trying, of course, to defend the humanism. He says explicitly that he is in the camp of the humanists. But I would say that it is something along the lines of a reflective humanism. And by this, I mean the humanism human humanism that is aware of what it is doing. So uh, humanism that reflects on uh, precisely these, this tendency that you always try to um, align things in a way that serve human purposes and that is trying to get away from this, but without sacrificing the the, 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 the conceptions that are crucial for, for human personality. So yeah, that's basically it. I think it's more or less covered the main parts at least. Bravo. hope that some of the parts were clear because there are a lot of these dialectical twists and pirouettes as you've noticed by now and Dupuy will constantly do them so sometimes it's difficult to capture them nicely <laughs> anyway on to the discussion yes Moritz Uh, yeah, just like a, a short remark to like the part um, with the philosopher's physics and the physicist's physics, like this separation between cognitive, cognitivism and cybernetics. I, I found it very funny to read like as, as a physicist myself, because I, I, I remember it like one time I was taking like two classes of a, a year in complex systems and I asked the professor if I could do a bachelor thesis or something. And I had like this kind of uh, rabbit hole moment where the professor was going like, yeah, but be aware if you go into complex systems, you will never be able to go back to physics. And I, I just like that was a couple of years ago. And I think like, yeah, it's a little bit more acknowledged now that complexity is a thing that physicists have to address. But I would say like just from my experience that like 95% of physics really does without that and is still in this what Dupree called the linear like uh, elaborate mechanics thinking this kind of mindset that um, we can still reduce complexity to like these linear rela relations can I ask you more so then how would you basically uh, analyze uh, like what he says about cognitivism from your physics perspective and also from the perspective of cognitive uh, science I mean as you have studied it now the last years um yeah I think it's a little bit difficult I think it's not as easy to like split it as Dupuy does it at least I don't don't see the split as obvious um but in general, like I share this kind of intuition that cognitivism is a little bit abstracted from um, naturalizing everything down to like the uh, physics level of explanation. Um, but yeah, in, in the end, I, I, I don't think that like uh, most of physics is doing this really strictly eliminativist uh, research as uh, you can often find in like philosophy of science discussions where they uh, put the physicists in a very strict camp, but like at least what I experienced from research, it's it's very instrumentalist for most of like the the fields, the levels of phenomena there that they are looking at. One of the things that. Um... We will also kind of try to uh, introduce and talk about is um, the that there's a lot of implicit 
and I mean this like li literally, that is to say, unarticulated philosophical um, uh, substance in complex dynamic systems. So I think that, you know, once you start taking them seriously, uh, all of a sudden you realize that you will need to re-articulate many of the <laughs> philosophical concepts and understand them differently. So a lot of things change. And one of the things that happened to cybernetics is that they started off by using this particular physics to pursue a very, very rigorous, very hardcore, orthodox, eliminativist approach in many ways. But then it imploded. So from within, the, what happened was the, 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 um, there appeared the second order cybernetics who showed basically that if you take complex systems theory, all of a sudden, certain things started happening where this is no longer functioning as neatly as they imagine it to be. So for example, you know, you have to start introducing the, the observer into the, into the equation of the whole story. And you start having, for example, um, self-organizing systems. And once you have self-organizing systems, you get self-referential systems and the, the, the whole, you know, Pandora's uh, box opens up, which cannot be closed easily. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of interesting things start happening. If you pursue this particular eliminativist naturalist project to its end, it implodes according to Dupuy. Yeah, that's that's why I'm uh, really hoping for more discussion of second order cybernetics in in the following chapters. I had the feeling like this was just mentioned a little bit, but uh, he didn't go really deep into it yet. Any further comments, questions? And also go into the other directions. There's a lot of ground. Michael? Yeah. Michael and Tarja. Yeah. Sorry, you can go first. Okay. So what I found really interesting in the chapter uh, was the analysis of the failure of cognitivism uh, in the sense that like somehow I don't know if I if I uh, received in received it properly. It was very dense. The discussion there was very dense, um, but somehow I got the impression that it's it's kind of a bastard notion in which you like smuggle in all this intentional content, you know, via via like this uh, symbolic approach, and at the same time you still want to make a nice mind and stay like in, in this kind of uh, paradigm. Um, and to me that sounded somehow like I'm not a um, specialist in any of that, but somehow he was able to put his finger on something that I always found somehow problematical. I thought there's a gap somewhere there and I don't understand like how all of this actually hang together. And then um, it did seem to me that Dupuy was nicely pointing out that actually they don't. <laughs> you, you just put all these things together, but actually like this, this middle mediating level isn't mediating anything. It's just, you know, kind of a, a band-aid there. <laughs> so I, I would, you know, I would be happy to hear any other kind of, uh, mm, receptions of this argument that he's making there and whether I'm I'm like uh, right in my inter in my interpretation what he's actually saying there about cognitivism no Tarja in my opinion yeah that's a I think that's a good interpretation the correct one for sure uh and yeah, I, I had the same feeling. I mean, I knew some of the critiques before, but he manages to neatly summarize them um, and put them together in a way where you see why this 
intermediary level doesn't really function all that well that sooner or later you're forced to kind of you know either go one direction or the other direction but it doesn't really manage to bridge the 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 the, the two to two domains i don't know anyone else any ideas on this Uh, um, yeah Sorry. mike michael go on and then andrea i was just gonna say i didn't i didn't fully understand what you were asking there taria and we, were you saying that um that dupuis characterization of the situation um you think he got wrong or or do you think like he was right about the characterization that this this symbolic intermediary layer is kind of not doing what the cognitivists um hoped it would uh yeah thanks for asking i i didn't mean to say that he was wrong or right i just meant to say that first to ask whether my interpretation of that was more or less correct and then i just wanted to say that in in my opinion uh, he somehow succeeded to uh point out the thing that I always found uh, problematical about like this cognitive, cog what he calls cognitivist approaches. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you. Andrea? Yeah, so I have to say I have a really hard time with this um, cognitivism, so what does it really come down to? So, you know, it's about this, it's this, do I have to think about it as a very formal system? So where I have symbols and I have syntax and I want to, you know, what's, what's the, what is this cognitivism approach after? So, I see that you know it's it's a matter you know it's it's based on on physics and it's based on Newtonian physics and I want to explain how the mind works on the basis of Newtonian physics and in a very formal system is this right and somehow I have to get the reason in so I have to somehow connect the the causes and the reason so that it's not a totally um how to say you know just totally formal system which is totally connected from from the human mind or do i get this totally wrong no you're pre precisely right so the 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 idea is to somehow bring together these two worlds the world of science which seems to be functioning operating with with uh, the notions of causality and basically there's no room for reason so for example if i go and i open a door it's basically everything can be accounted for in a mechanical way as a cause and effect but at the same time if you ask me why did you open the 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 the, the door or the, the the window i will give a reason for it because i'm hot or because i'm cold or because you know, I just uh, feel kind of cramped right now. So how do you bring these two stories together? This is what they're trying to say. And one way is to say, well, you know, the, 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 the realm of reason is basically something that is an appearance uh, which seems to have a certain essence, but its essence is basically can be accounted for uh, in the realm of causality. That would be the cybernetician's approach. But then you had the, the cognitivists who said, well, you know, we, we want to be scientists, but at the same time, we do not want to say that reasons are completely irrelevant. So how do we manage to save this? Let's introduce the intermediary realm where you have symbolic processing, which is happening, and it is happening at the level of certain syntactical rules. So you have a certain, you know, law-like structure but it is not embedded necessarily in, into a very specific causal uh, framework. So that means that if I can implement the same uh, structural, uh, same synthetic structure in different physical substrates, I still get you know, the same thing. Now, does this save the reasons? Well, 
you know, you could say maybe yes, it, it doesn't reduce them to physical causes. Does the does it save them? In a certain sense, not really, because you have these mechanisms working their thing on the symbolic level. Yeah. So you might say, I have an impression that I did this for this and this reason, but the cognitivist would say, Yeah, but you know, this was actually happening at the level of symbols where you have these processes, and this is maybe even outside of your conscious uh, accessibility. So yeah, Andrea, it, it's a problem. So it's an attempt to bring them together, but both sides would probably be dissatisfied with this solution. So it's more than I'm 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 a zombie. So everybody is a zombie. So you you do things without you know being conscious about doing it because uh, you have this you are operating in this. Um, in this very formal, you know, framework or mechanistic framework in this Newtonian framework. But then when cybernetic is coming in and as far as understood it, then, you know, it's it's a, a kind of a approach of a, to mechanize uh, the mind. Mm -hmm. so, and, uh, you know, instead of Newtonian physics, and now I have, um, I also take all these nonlinear and complex system into account, which come, you know, naturally in when you talk about feedback, it's, it's nonlinear. So it was mm -hmm. right there at the beginning. So I'm, I mean, you know, you have to help me out here. So how do I get then? I understand the mechanization of the mind, but here also I'm, I'm doing, how do I come the intentions in so that I do something intentionally <laughs> okay uh, i would just say something briefly and then moritz can chime in and then ella yeah. uh, did, uh according to cyberneticians basically you can model uh intentions with these ongoing loops so for them basically okay, having these then, loops then. and 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 um uh, and uh, the cognitivists wouldn't have a good answer for that, according to cyberneticians, if they could say they 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 well they would probably have provide some account, but uh, I I don't not sure how they would uh, how they would solve this. Anyway, Moritz. Yeah, I just wanted to to add like two short remarks. The first one is like uh, at least how I understand it, like the historical context of cognitivism, which at, at least helped me to understand like what they were going for is a little bit like that they, most of the ideas were basically an answer to behaviorism where you have like input and output relations of like, you get predictions, uh, you do behavior and like what's going on in the middle is kind of a black box. And um, a lot of the cognitivist ideas are basically motivated by opening the black box and looking what's going on internally between like making having sensations and like have, doing behavior and um the second thing that i would like to add um for the cognitivists that i didn't really see in dupuy is i i think like the analogy to newton newtonian mechanics is a little bit difficult because at least the work that I read never really had the goal of like doing Newton mechanics, but like doing it on a kind of abstract level where you still have like effects and causes and can neatly separate them, but they're looking for some kind of abstract level. For example, one psychological model deals with, it's called the BDI model, beliefs, desires, and intentions. And like, it tries to basically model how behavior arises by assuming that like cognitive agents have beliefs, desires and intentions that you can somehow formally uh, model and then you can capture them like in a mathematical framework and then try to um, explain how certain behaviors arise. And I don't think that is like eliminativist or like Newton mechanics in any way. It's just like an analogy of like finding linear relations between beliefs, desires, intentions, and uh, behavior. Yeah, Moritz, I would just like to maybe add or qualify this. When I when I said that it was an elaborate uh, Newtonian mechanics, I basically was referring to what Depew was saying that they were still kind of operating in this precisely this idea, for example, understanding causality as a sophisticated version of the billiard ball approach. So, you know, you have cause, we, it, it seems like we all know what efficient causality is, you have a cause and you, you know, uh, you have an effect. 
and uh, it's it's linear in a certain sense. Uh, and this was just introduced. So wh when I was saying this, I meant this, not necessarily strictly Newtonian mechanics. Of course, everybody in the cognitivist camp would say we have progressed since then, but certain fundamental theoretical posits or tenets or kind of retained that was the main main point so that's just a brief qualification uh, so yeah e okay. Ella. okay good good to clarify that yeah i was just thinking about the um you you mentioned the the kantian axis so basically that you have like an ontological reductionism but a epistemological non non-reducibility like where where would this fit in this cognitivist and cybernetician dynamic because in a way you know this epistemological irreducibility still i don't know preserves i guess a, a, a certain thing um i don't know maybe if you could maybe comment on that a bit more well, yeah, um, so what uh, Dupuy is referring to is uh, to Kant's conception of the organisms from his third critique, where he basically says that when I am confronted with the organism, I am confronted with a phenomenon that isn't really easily accounted for in the framework of the classical Newtonian mechanics. So I have a certain specific relationship between the whole and its parts that seems to be different than, for example, in the ordinary things. So I have a whole that that exists because of its parts, but at the same time, parts that are parts only because of its whole, because they are part of this particular whole. So there is a certain almost like an autopoietic relationship there. And Kant has an issue then, you know, what am I going to do with this? Does that mean that, for example, you have irreducible holes that behave like teleological holes and I have to introduce a separate um, set of laws into the story? And for example, Hans Driesch, the, the notorious vitalist from the beginning of the 20th century, followed this route. He was a Kantian in this regard and he said, we basically do need something like that. We need the laws that would account for what he referred to as entelechy, which is the life force. And he was kind of trying to be serious philosophically with regards to this. Kant's solution was not this. He said that what we need to do is we need to recognize that there are certain phenomena that if we want to account for them, if we want to provide a certain explanation for them, we will need to revert to certain heuristical notions such as teleology, for instance, or um, a wholeness or something. But these are just epistemic. So they are useful shorthands that I can use in the biological science, for example. But ultimately, they should be reducible to the mechanistic conception of the world. So <laughs> it's not a particularly satisfying solution in my view. And this was kind of something that was a big thing and it was constantly emphasized, but, and it could go in different directions. But Kant somehow tried, not unlike our friends cognitivists did, to have his cake and eat it too. So <laughs> he tried to remain like systematically and rigorously mechanistic in his worldview conception, but at the same time, open up the doors to certain epistemological conceptions that or notions that could be inescapable for us to be able to um, account for certain phenomena. How they are interrelated remains mysterious. And we so far have not yet had the Newton of the, how does he call it, glass blade. So whoever will be able to account for this will be the Newton of the glass blade. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna... oh. sorry. I just wanted to ask, like, what about um, accounting for this on a, on the social level? I mean, isn't isn't that a direction that it went into? Um, so, I mean, the because mechanization remains on still on the level of. Um, an in individual um and i don't know for for me i i guess I, I i have this strong philosophical hunch that certain things can only be accounted for on a for instance intentionality and, and such 
on a social level. Yeah, okay, maybe somebody else can comment on this. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how this would necessarily solve the problem, but Andrea, you wanted to comment something on this? No? Okay. Michael, I don't know whether this... I'm sorry, Ella. I, I I don't know what to say. So if if you want to didn't want to say anything else. Okay, so maybe if anybody would like to comment on this before Michael says something else. Because it is an interesting distinction for sure. Also for for the our model making group Andrea and Aria. I mean, Sellers has this, I guess, a lot, and Brandon. That's why I'm. That's why I know it. I, I um, know. I know in which direction you're trying to. <laughs> I'd be curious to hear more because I'm not. I'm not fully understanding. To to be honest, Ella, what what your question was. I don't know. Maybe 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 we can talk about it like on the in the next chapters if it likes. If it if it pops up, it um, will. Mm. But but I, I don't know. I, I mean, was this very unclear? So uh, just Kant famously said that some phenomena behave as if they were teleological. So you know, there's like a heuristic that you need to take to a bio, bio, biologists will not be able to escape providing these type of, for example, teleological judgments, but they do not necessarily ontologically refer to anything that would be, you know, actually pertaining to any ontology as such, uh, to, to teleology as such. The, he's got a famous passage as well in, I think it says critique of judgment. I see it, it turns up the same sort of passage on... Yeah natural purposes and natural ends isn't it and he has he has this example of a watch and and where he said the parts kind of don't exist for each other but and the whole only exists in the mind of an external maker the person who, who made the watch whereas with natural well we'll say organisms the holes exist um the parts and the whole exist by and for themselves, by means of and for themselves. And, and so it's as if he's um, forecasting this notion of autopoiesis. I don't know, that's where it kind of went, Sebastian, uh, when, you, when you were talking about, about Kat there, is that? Yeah, um, th this is very much related to that. Daria, did you want to comment on this? Yeah, I was okay. just... Yeah, thinking about this as if solution. Um, well, I mean, when it comes to uh, scientific modeling, I mean, there are many models which precisely give us as if solutions. For instance, like economic models have been criticized for uh, for basically explaining something in terms of that people behave as if they, they, they're maximizing. And that's why we have... <laughs> The kind of phenomena we have and then rightly so some others have said that well this is unsatisfactory <laughs> we need to come up with some better like uh, explanations for this but I, I don't know how then this actually relates to Kant's solution that much but obviously if you posit something like you give as a kind of a solution and an as if solution it's it's going to be problematic, I think, I mean, in principle. It's kind of placeholder for <laughs> better explanation. Yeah, Kant's solution was basically, in a certain sense, not really a proper solution. It was just, you know, I mean, it's very unsatisfactory in many ways and on many different levels, I would say. Um, because you're, yeah, I, I mean, maybe we would, if we had someone like a proper Kantian here, he would be, or he or she would be able to defend this better. <laughs> I'm just kind of trying to 
uh, draw a rudimentary picture without necessarily uh, being uh, very sympathetic to his solution and also maybe to uh, you know be able to provide all the details of it. So, yeah, yeah. That's precisely the reason why I'm being cautious here as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not wanting to commit myself at all in any critique of Kant. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the muscle to do it. Like. Well, for, from my understanding, this particular solution is uh, ultimately untenable. So you are forced to do something with it. Yeah. So you, you have to kind of take it. It's, it's one of these solutions that's similar to the one provided by cognitivism. It, it seems that it is not tenable and that you're forced to kind of take a certain route. It, it's, um, yeah, it just uh, doesn't seem to be able to uh, hold its ground. But anyway, Michael. Thanks. The, it's fun. It's a funny experience now going over these terms, cybernetics and cognitivism, um, again, that and I think you did a fabulous job of, of, of presenting what was is kind of like a, not an easy, easy chapter. I, th I think like if, if without prior familiarity with, with, any of this space like this is this is it's deep in already and and the two terms are interesting for me in particular coming from like a, yeah, the analytic philosophy of mind background and philosophy of a back a, a, ai background like the terms cognitivism and cybernetics never come up you know like people are like what's cognitivism and and so now now I'm sitting here going confused after a couple of years of writing and, and thinking like well, what the hell is the distinction here again? And I, I, I don't know. So that the way I and I, I'm having to go over it again just to in my head just to, to to find my feet a bit. And in my head, cognitivism kind of was more in in the domain of psychology than than say philosophy. Um, and in a psychological movement of an, of an attempt to, uh, and, I, and I guess I'm saying this in the hope that anyone anyone can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, that my understanding was that cognitivism, or that they, these were sort of two separate movements, um, and coming from separate domains, and that cognitivism I understood was more from the perspective of psychology. And cybernetics was this Macy conferences, engineers and physicists and mathematicians and information theorists getting together. And that, and that what kind of held them both together was an attempt to, or at least what retrospectively we can say that united them was an attempt to remove sort of internal mentality from um, a description of mind. Um, and so, and that's you know, where the behaviorism in the, in the context of psychology came up, like, oh, we're going to have explanations that don't have to refer to internal states. And that cybernetics found, hey, we can duplicate or simulate um, aspects of cognition um, in mechanical systems. And therefore, in that way, we can make it, we can, we can have explanations about cognitive functions that make no, again, make no reference to um, sort of internal mental qualia kind of things. So in my head beforehand, they, these cybernetics and cognitivism were quite distinct movements. The cybernetics was, was this particular kind of movement out of the Macy conferences. Um, Claude Shannon, von Neumann, um, and those kind of folks. And then cognitivism was, was this other thing. And so when, when Dupuy puts them together like that, like, and, and, and it's an, it's, I don't know, it's, it's almost as if he, they're now, now more confused before. I don't know if, I don't know if any of that was helpful or more confused as anyone else. On the same page there, or would anyone like to comment? Because I I would really like to reduce my 
frequency of <laughs> intervening. Yeah, Andrea. No, I have to say I found this very helpful because uh, now I felt the same confusion. So um, because I, I was, you know, I, you know, I got these um, these hands that there was, you know, what you say, you know, you take the mental out, you know, that there was they were taking it out. But I also I was always thinking, so but how do they take it back in? So this was my question about the, the reason, how to get reason in, because, um, you know, this is my maybe naive picture of, of a human, you know, you have a reason for doing something, you know, opening the window or stuff. And as you're saying, you know, nicely put it, you know, you take all this metal stuff out, you know, you have this very mechanized, you know, as you say, the, 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 the aim of cybernetics was the mechanization of the mind. And the other perspective which um you also you pointed out in the end so that this mechanization of the mind was something which the scientists themselves were doing so the mind was doing this kind of taking its own mentality out by doing this so this this split it was you know you you described it very nicely and and you know it's it's still for me it's um it's hard to digest but I think you know your comment made it really clear to me now what's what what it is. What's somehow for me, I find it a little bit disturbing. I have to say. Yeah. Thanks. Any any further comments on on this, on Michael's and Andrea's reflections? Yeah, Moritz. Yeah, I mean. Um... The confusion, I think, really, for me, stems from like clearly separating these two lines of research, which, as far as I know, were overlapping to a big degree, because a lot of the like symbolic AI, like the first phase where people try to really do something with artificial intelligence, um, I don't know. I would I would kind of see that in like being influenced by cognitivists and cyberneticists, and. Um, I, I don't think they were successful, but like after that, uh, connectionism took over and um, connectionism really doesn't give you any reasons for why there is a certain behavior, right? If you have a complex neural network and um, you can artificially or like you can simulate it in a certain way that it gives an, a certain output, then it doesn't give you a reason why it gave that output. So, um, it, it, it seemed like they sticked with like the trying to figure out what internally is going on, but like doing away with reason altogether, even like from scientific explanation standpoint. Yeah, Andrea and then Gregor. You know, a short comment to, to what Moritz said. So I, I did some research when I was um, still a physicist. I did this simulation of neural networks. So, and, you know, I think it's, yeah, it's right. And now I'm starting to wonder why I never really questioned, you know, this, this kind of approach. And you know, one reason was it was so deeply embedded into physics. So it was for me, you know, for me, it was um, always spin glass models and not so much neural network models. So this shows how deeply embedded it was. So it doesn't even came up, you know, that you would ask these kind of questions about reasons, intentionalities, behaviors, and these kind of things. The only thing we were studying was pattern recognition. But this also was very clear that you know, we are far away from anything what's going on in, in our in our brain. And it was only when I talked years later to to um to David Hopfield. So when when I John Hopfield, so when when and and he told me that for him it was always important to show how different it is. You know, how different these physics models from you know these neural networks models you know, coming from physics are from what's actually going on in the brain, what we already see, you know, how well we, you know, we recognize a person, even if the picture is not very good, but how bad we are in arithmetic. So this, um, therefore, the first time I, I, I got also this impression, okay, there's, 
there's something you know it's it's more of you know it made something clear to me why these networks were never really about you know neural networks or about the brain but you know and this being deeply situated in physics also never occurred that people were asking you know these kind of questions which are asked by dp Great. Gregor. Yeah, very, very interesting discussion to follow. Like, I have an idea maybe why uh, it feels a bit confusing or it, Dupuy makes this very unique combination and there is something going on that maybe where people were trying or are trying to have it both ways. In a way, on the one hand, have this reductionist um, aim of getting rid of anything theological intentionality we don't go don't go there it's 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 bad and at the same time that's exactly what we want and need to capture and I, it, i'm not sure if, if you share that feeling it just reminded me also of the general reductionist programs in different fields where in biology it was often exactly also a bit paranoid split between oh we need intentionality or please let's stay away from intentionality as much as possible. Um, and other fields like economics where then uh, reduction was strived for exactly, we want to base things on how on the microeconomic level, individual agents have preferences and intentions and behave. And um, is, is, is that at all related like for the general debate and, and sources that Dupuis was building upon, um, at the, the general zeitgeist of the time to have this push for reduction that I also felt interesting on page 20, the mentioning of molecular biology, where probably I would say it was also driven by this reductionist mechanization attitude, the view of a cell as a machine and, and the information language. Is it really, um, is this tension between let's try to capture intentionality and it's just a matter of we just need to fiddle around with the physical laws we already have or discover some new laws we can do it with the tools we already have um, or the push and realizing no it doesn't work we should stay away from intentionality and any of that sort let's it's a swamp let's not go there might this be a case of, of where this kind of transformation happens? Why, when we hear these terms today, we we, we um, have so a hard such a hard time putting it at the right place because this was exactly a shift in the debate where where this intentionality, yes or no, was kind of changing direction. Uh, does that make any sense at all to anyone? Yeah, it does. Um, I don't know. Would somebody? Want to comment on this? Have a few thoughts to share then. So, okay, maybe uh, you asked whether, um, in a certain, in many ways, uh, what cyberneticians were trying to do is they were very much, as we will see in later chapters, they were very much in tune with what was happening. At the very avant-garde of science so they they kind of knew for example uh and not only many people knew about this stuff but weren't really necessarily um reflecting on the implications of this so what were the more far-reaching implications of certain notions and how they might be maybe used in different domains outside of the domains in which were they developed they were developed so for example they really took seriously the 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 notion of uh, homeostasis uh, and they combined this with the preliminary developments in the field of field of um, of uh, what is that what what later became known as chaos theory, and this was very scattered back then. So you know, um, th th it was only I think in 60s and 70s that um, that people that were working on what later became known as chaos theory and dynamic systems theory kind of they, they they started actually coming together and they realized that wow we're basically kind of we, we've been uh, stumbling across similar ideas and problems in different fields and mm -hmm. 
we were kind of developing stuff. So it, it wasn't like, you know, you had a textbook where you could just, oh, okay, chaos theory. Now I'm going to study the fundamental. That wasn't, but they were just familiar with some of these ideas and notions. And they, they tried to bring them together and they, they tried to develop, they tried to develop a science of systems, of regulated systems. So for them, for example, you know, if you have a projectile that behaves as if similar to say a living being that tries to follow a certain something, uh, so a certain predator following the prey, following the prey or something like that. And if you have a projectile that moves in a similar way, where you basically have the target moves and the projectile is able to follow, if you're able to model this, you know, th there seems to be, okay, so what is the mechanism that I'm using for this? And it would seem that there's this feedback loop and all of a sudden they had, oh, feedback loop, you know, what can mm. we do with this particular concept? This particular con concept kind of, you know, introduces whole, a lot of new possibilities. Um, uh -huh, Moritz has to leave, bye-bye Moritz. Uh, so yeah, so, so basically uh, it wasn't even necessarily that they were trying to be, reduction is per se so that they would be like yeah we need to kind of you know they, they were very often they came from the scientific background and they thought well look like there, there, there are all these concepts cropping up yeah mm -hmm. all these tools so what can we do with this you know maybe we can as you as you will also see they were they were they were a very heterogeneous and very eccentric bunch like these cyberneticians they were all extremely eccentric if you read any of their stuff for example if you read if you read the the, the textbook uh, the embodiments of fine by by McCullough. That's that's the weirdest stuff ever. You will have like mm -hmm. uh, pages of complicated mathematics, and then all of a sudden several pages of poetry, and then mm -hmm. you know certain philosophical reflect. These was these was <laughs> strange people. So I think there's also like a social and personal reason why these more uh, let's say. Um, uh, high bro later cognitivists didn't really want to associate with them like i said it, it's one of those uncles you know you have an uncle he's a bit of an eccentric a bit of an artist known in some circles also kind of notorious in others nobody really wants to talk about it everybody knows about him that those were seven editions so uh they were trying to just kind of toy around with many things uh and yeah they develop they, they try to pursue a certain approach that would maybe kind of use these concepts and uh yeah okay Tarja bye bye so we, we will also wrap up in a couple five ten minutes or 15 I don't know how many people uh want to stay uh but yeah so th that would be the answer so you know that there was a lot of things happening and they just kind of were drawing on these different things and uh and then trying to apply them yeah so given the fact that everybody will shortly leave maybe another question or two and then we can wrap it up Maybe Michael, if he has some final comments before he goes. We can hear you now. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, don't really know what to say now. The, the, there's, I don't know. I, I I guess what what resonates for me is that I see the heritage of this thinking that's still still here in the way that we're making sense of AI now, and that's that's sort of where the my boots hit the ground as far as I'm reading this and going, okay, so how is it? What kind of you know what difference is this going to make to me? Okay, and it's helping me understand. Um, for example, I, you know, I was just thinking earlier about there's this orthogonality thesis um, that Nick Bostrom in his book on superintelligence talks about, and it's uh, where he's talking, trying to explain why superintelligence is a this existential risk. And he, he has this thesis about the nature of intelligence that it's basically independent from goals such that we can have, imagine uh, a system of more or less any level in, of intelligence um, 
pursuing more or less any goal. So we get this whole paperclip maximizing superintelligence scenario. And there's, for me, there's a, I, I can see the heritage of what we've been talking about. And I think, I think it's maybe most clear in, so Norbert Wiener's book on, on cybernetics, the subtitle of which is control and communication in the machine. I think, I think that that notion of control um, and control systems, the anti-aircraft systems, Sebastian, the, uh, the anti-aircraft weapon system that, that you were just describing, I think, Sebastian, are these control systems, whether we're talking about telephones and electrical communication systems that, that, um, the, what's his name, the information theory guy, Shannon was talking of, that he was having as his basic model that, that these are control systems where we're trying to have coordinated passage of signals within this body, uh, within this, within the machine, right? And that the machine only works if there is this coordinated um, processing of, 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 of signals internal to it. And that all of like, that the functioning of the machine that is independent to the goal is really important because and, and that's where because it means that we it means that we we can talk about the capacity of a machine, or in this case, this mechanized mind, we can talk about the capacity of a mechanized mind in a way that's independent from why we're doing anything, why the reasons why. And so we we I see here in, in this cybernetic and, and cognitivist picture the, the kind of the birth of a conception of mind that talks about how it can do stuff how it can solve problems without or in a way that divorce divorces it from like an accounting for why that problem is worth engaging at all right the meaning thing um the meaning question so so i think yeah i see in these systems we have these control systems we have this picture of of um of a mind, if you want, that 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 can tell us how the mind solves this problem, but not why that mind wants to, or why it's meaningful to that mind to solve that problem, and kind of like, um, well, no, it doesn't matter to go around that, that down that direction, but I think. Um, that's one of the real something that's really important for me going forward where we're like okay we don't need to talk about any of this internal mind stuff um and and by doing that we can have this model of the mind this mechanized model of the mind and then oh crap wait now we don't know now we have machines that are, are doing are making paper clips um how have we gone wrong here it's like, oh, well, maybe we got a bit excited with our initial model of mind and started to run with it and, and, and things. So it's, I don't know, it's just very interesting to, to see how these, um, these things kind of got, got all kicked off. That was a bit of a ramble. Thank you for the space. Yeah, since we are nearing the, the end, I'll just maybe uh, say that for me, the most fascinating uh, part was precisely also the one that Andrea was uh, mentioning. Um, like the, the, the critique that he provides when he talks about humanism and anti-humanism, where he basically draws on this idea of the split mindedness and schizophrenia, as I called it, like it's such an ingenious move. Where you know you kind of have this impression that something is off, and uh, <coughs> the the more the the stronger the 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 more uh, seemingly all encompassing the mechanized mechanized mind, the more almost deified the mechanizing mind becomes. <laughs> so the 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 more you move away from what you normally would construe as mind being something that is different the more you underscore it to the point that it becomes completely separate from everything else so, so the more you want to enworld the mind the more you want to objectify it 
the more it de-reifies itself as that which precisely does this particular process. So that which tries to reify becomes utterly de-reified. So you know, a, a very specific it, it the the uh, at the bottom of it is the way I see it. Dupuy will claim basically this is basically one attitude that the mind can take, you know, and you cannot get away from this, that this too is an attitude. It's a very schizophrenic attitude because you get this strange separation, strange split. But at the same time, you know, there is always an attitude, but you can also have a different attitude to it. So you can, you know, and I think that some of the approaches that are trying to constantly emphasize the, the domain of corporeality, domain of vitality are doing precisely this. There are different modes of being and different modes for the mind to relate both to itself and the world. And this is just a very extreme way of a very specific attitude that was developed as a systematic program, systematic epistemic program at the beginning of the 16th century. If you take it to its extreme, this is where it will end up. But even here, it is unable to get away from the mindedness of the mind in a certain sense. I found this just, you know, there, there's there's so much in that and there's such brilliance in that. And, you know, like the, 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 the very fact that there's a, a shadow lurking constantly in the background of all the... So it's almost like, you know, if you want to have everything lit up, there is always the, the blind spot that provides the light. <laughs> for this so even if you light up everything if everything becomes cartesian clare et distincte there is the 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 eternal dark spot that has to be there in order for this to be able to even happen so yeah very interesting i don't know i found this uh, very intriguing a, a brilliant way of kind of providing this critique no, yeah Anyone else <laughs> may want to say something about this? I think thanks for working out that twist. Like it, it really helps a lot putting into perspective what we've read. Uh, mm. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, glad glad if something was helpful. Well, I don't know if if. There are no further comments. Maybe we can even wrap this up. Michael has to go anyway. I'm guessing that others as well. Unless there's still something that you would like to discuss. Okay, then let's continue next time. Uh, Ella, did, did you want to comment something? Uh, okay. Okay, then uh, we s next session is in two weeks. Yeah, in two weeks. And Andrea and you and Tarja have the presentation. Yeah, okay. And yeah, we will also need, uh, before we say goodbye, we also need another person for the meeting after that one. And everything else is covered, if I'm not mistaken. So if anybody would be so kind to volunteer, maybe Gregor, for instance, uh, <laughs> or Moritz, uh, to present that particular chapter, that would be awesome. So with that said, be well, enjoy your Friday and enjoy your weekend. Bye, Ciao, bye-bye.